Now we have with us Professor Anthony Edison. Uh, he's the CEO, uh, Architect Professional Examination Authority in Scotland. So uh, I will I will add Tony. Hello, Tony. Welcome. Hello. Thank How you. How are you today? I'm well. I'm well. I'm wide awake. I had my coffee. I'm good. Wonderful. Good to go. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So uh, tell us, uh, would you like to start? Yeah, I can start now. So, Lefteris, you, uh, you're my visuals guy today. Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Of course. Would you like your, your PPT? PPT? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Mm. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm going to go down and I'm going to start. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. So it's the um, it, it's really strange being in a, a virtual um, system like this. You know, normally I'm in a lecture theatre with uh, people in front of me, or in a conference um, conference hall. But um, I can't see your faces, but hopefully you can see me. So Lefteris, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, to speak at the event, and to all the participants who uh, who I can't see at the moment, but Hopefully you can see me. Good morning. Hope you're all well. Hope you've all had your coffee and are wide awake. So in preparing this talk, I was really wondering what I could usefully squeeze out of a lifetime of working in and amongst uh, the creative community, creative professionals, creative um, academics. With a majority of that time, not all of it, some of it was in practice and continues to be in practice. So I still have uh, one foot in, in the real world, you could say. But the majority of, of the time uh, that I've spent working um, has been in higher education, has been in teaching, researching, administering, and leading in, uh, in higher education institutions in different parts of the world. One thing that stayed with me for a long time, nine years ago, um, I read a publication and I often refer back to it. And you, you may want to make note of it or, you know, we can provide a reference later, but it's, uh, it's really a must read. It's um, for all those involved in higher education. It's called An Avalanche is Coming. It was written by a chap called Martin Barber back in 2013 and it was really to to do what we're doing at the moment which is to provoke creative dialogue and challenge complacency in our traditional higher education institutions and that's exactly what it did when when i read it i got really excited by it and now nine years later i can see it was like the the nostradamus of higher education in the UK and, and in some parts of the, the world. I can see many of the predictions already in place and others I can see are, are well on the way. There's an infrastructure there to enable these other things that are mentioned in, um, in, the, in the publication to come in. Sometimes an innovation needs to wait in the sidelines until the world is ready for it or until, in more practical terms, the, the infrastructure necessary for it to flourish is ready for it. And the time is, the time is rife, I think, for more of the predictions in An Avalanche is Coming to, um, you know, to materialize. So I'd, I'd really recommend you, you give that a read. So we're living in interesting and exciting times and that's a good thing this is what makes things challenging if things didn't challenge us then we'd become complacent and the old adage plus ça change plus c'est la même chose the more things change the more they stay the same uh, would be the norm and that would be awful that would that would be the worst situation for all of us i think so in, in my 25 years plus in, as a leader in higher education, 
and you, you'll see what I mean by, by that in a moment. Uh, was I able to fix everything that, that I really thought needed fixing? I mean, most of the audience today, you know, by nature of this event, you'll have in mind things that, that need fixing in education, in the industry, etc. Was I able to, to fix everything to my satisfaction in the 25 years that I that I had? Uh, no, absolutely not. But that's that's not how change happens. It's um, it's incremental. It takes time, and it's interconnected. Okay. Uh, I'm, I've got a few notes just so I don't miss anything out on here. I'm not reading from PowerPoints, which which I, I didn't want to do. However, I am going by my notes. So what I'm what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to talk candidly and personally about my own personal experiences. The reason I'm doing this is because it's it's a message I'd like to get across to all of you. I think self-awareness is very important, not least in helping to develop those that we educate and those that we influence. I was taught the importance of this from a very early age and only discovered what it's called later in life. It's called autoethnography. Okay, and officially autoethnography auto is uh, it involves the thinking about and typically writing about a topic of great personal relevance, um, situating your experience within the social context. It requires deep reflection on one's own unique experiences and the universal within oneself. Really, it helps us understand, it helps us see and understand the way we perceive everything around us. It's... Uh, it helps us understand what we like, what we don't like, what our prejudices are, where they come from. It colors our attitude to work, to colleagues, to relationships, to motivation, to creativity. Now, if we're talking about students, their attitude to study, it colors everything. So um, autoethnography is one of the take home messages that I'd really like to to put across. It's a really worthwhile thing doing. And, um, you know, if we are looking at students and their education, having a, a deeper self awareness would help them really in every aspect of their work, most mostly when we're when we're looking at teaching, we look at method, we look at how, not why. So, you know, students will well be able to follow the instructions that we give them on design thinking, design methodology, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, that's the algorithm, that's how to do it, but not why they are thinking, what they're thinking whilst they're doing it. Autoethnography will, will sort of address those issues. So that was a, a bit of a long preamble, but um, here we go. Left Terrace is, uh, thank you. Uh, looking after the visuals uh, for this presentation. So if we could go with the first slide on the first PowerPoint, Left Harris, thank you. Okay. So here we are. This is a um, personal and professional snapshot of the past 20 years or so, uh, at least as I see them, as I perceive them. Um, there's a few quirky things thrown in as well. I just wanted to create maybe a little bit of empathy with you, which isn't really easy with a virtual audience. I'm, I'm much happier face-to-face, person-to-person. But uh, I'll tell you a few quirky things as well. So the big thing that jumps out, Professor, yes, I've been a professor and chair of design, which includes all the disciplines, of design that, that you could imagine. I can't think of one that uh, that I've, I've not been responsible for in one way or another, either as an administrator or a professor or as a teacher uh, of these things. So if we start in the, the upper right, uh, I became 
uh, about 20 years ago, and I'm only speaking about the twice, past 20 years. Prior to that, I was a student. Prior to that, uh, then became, worked in uh, architectural practice, then design practice, then worked as a lecturer, senior lecturer, et cetera, et cetera, in the UK. But the key point was this move to Australia, which colors what comes next. So, um, yeah, I, I became chair of design and um, head of a fac head of a department, then a faculty of uh, design and architecture in Australia and the University of Newcastle, in fact, in New South Wales, uh, taught me many, many things. It was a new culture. Uh, I, you know, if any of you have worked in Australia and the British, there's you know, perhaps a, a certain way in which the indigenous Australians uh, welcome or otherwise uh, Brits, those from the UK coming over because of their past history, etc. So there were many, many, many challenges, but it was, um, it was a really interesting position. We had uh, regional students, national students, Australian students. It was a, it was a regional university. Uh, so most of the students came from New South Wales, although we did have an awful lot from Scandinavia, uh, would you believe, who were a little bit older, a little more mature, uh, really, really interesting to, to teach. So there was a really good diversity there. Um, following that, uh, if I squint at the screen, I can see that, yes, Mauritius. Uh, that was my first foray really into uh, establishing a university branch campus overseas. Wasn't, wasn't just teaching. In fact, it wasn't teaching at all. It was, um, it was setting it up. It was setting up the infrastructure. It was negotiating with uh, architects, builders, it was working with the financial partners that we had over there that uh, had invested in the uh, the building that we Middlesex University uh, took on. It was working with the Ministry of Higher Education and making sure the degrees uh, that we were offering from UK degrees from Middlesex University were um, were okay, were accepted and had an equivalence within Mauritius. So those graduating could find work in Mauritius if they wanted to, or more typically South Africa, where the salaries were a lot higher than, um, than Mauritius, for, for at least in the creative industries. So that was, that, 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 was, um, that was the first foray into academic leadership, if you like, and I was beginning to see I, you know, I had a, a, a firm foundation, an inkling and a firm foundation of the profit driven nature of universities, both public and private. And of course, this was a, 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 a partnership between a UK university and a private institution in Mauritius. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was uh, eye opening in that respect. But uh, I, I, saw the, I saw the necessity for making a profit for a university and, or, or else it wouldn't exist. And it's to nobody's benefit if that happens. Uh, so there we are, that was a seminal moment. Then on to Singapore, where um, <clears throat> again, came, uh, it was a different role. It, it was more academic, but uh, very entrepreneurial. It was a role based in Singapore for an Australian university that had 15 branch campuses in various parts of uh, Southeast Asia. And one of my remits was to open more branch campuses uh, in India, in China, in Hong Kong, out of Mongolia, would you believe? So uh, from 12, we, we quickly went up to about 20 during the time that I was there. And it was very, very interesting. 
um, not least, you know, I was very much attached to um, not teaching but mentoring the 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 lecturers and mentoring the the professors there, and meeting with the students. Of course, you meet with the students regularly for uh, you know for quality assurance for students. Um, feedback on teaching and learning. And there was a very, very different cohort of students there that I wasn't familiar with. They were driven by different things to study. And there was a lot of pressure on them. It was quite different to Mauritius and certainly Australia and the UK, which was a little more laid back. Singapore, there's a lot of pressure on students to, to achieve. Okay. Then on to Cyprus, that was really interesting. I, I, I helped establish, I was part of establishing a private new uh, University of the, the Arts. It wasn't a university when it started, so part of the role was making sure we, we gained the accreditation as a university. And uh, I was there for three years. It was an amazing experience, again, quite quite a lot of connection to the experience that I'd had before with setting up universities and uh, the quality assurance, et cetera. But this one needed, a, quite quickly, it needed a, an international profile which and partnerships, which we're able to achieve, which, was, uh, which worked well. Then on to the almost the latest role, which was three years in Cairo, and that was for Coventry University, setting up the Coventry University branch campus, campus rather, in Cairo. And again, it was, it was different in, in many respects. A lot, a lot was similar in terms of setting the university up, but a lot was different in terms of the cohorts and the nature of the students that we that we had and the issues that the staff had teaching them. I had two roles here. I was director of campus, so I was directing the, the, the whole campus. But I was also, uh, because of my previous background in the creative industries, I was head of um, the design art and design department, which included School of Architecture, graphic design, uh, multimedia, etc. And uh, the students there were, were really quite different. So you can see across those that experience, what I'm really trying to focus on is that a student is not a student. You can't, you ca you can't define a student. Uh, there's an expression in English, you can't tar everyone with the same brush. In other words, there's, there's certainly an international uh, difference between student cohorts and you know quite different methodologies that you need for teaching. Uh, next is the photograph of um, a Highland cow, which represents Scotland for me. I've just recently taken on a post dedicated to architecture, dedicated to the uh, the registration of new architects in Scotland. It's a gateway basically without passing the exam, which this organization administers and delivers, you cannot become a registered architect. Uh, so um, in that way, I'm really happy that, you know, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a journey that is culminating in, in something I'm really happy with. And I'm also happy it's a not-for-profit organization because uh, I took on this role in August this year. And until then, I'd spent a lifetime in the corporate world. And, you know, by the corporate world, I, I do mean um, public and private universities. Private universities have always been profit-driven. Uh, public universities are becoming more so. Uh, but um, I'm happy to get out of that and to to focus on on you know something a, a little bit different.
Um, there we are. First time um, I've used this uh, system, but uh, we're back on track. So we're in Scotland working for a nonprofit organization. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. But what I wanted to do was to just by way of empathy more than anything else was just to add a few other quirky things that aren't aren't really relevant to um, to the professional sort of line journey that I'm taking. Um, in my spare time, uh, I sculpt. So I've always drawn, I've always sculpted. Um, there's there's a, a couple of couple of images um, on the lower left there. One was for an international competition a few years ago. Now, what what I wanted to put that in for was to to maybe to maybe look at the the um, the concept of procrastinating again in our students and again in our, our sort of daily lives to try and try and knock that on the head and try and stop that. I've always enjoyed drawing. I've always enjoyed painting. I've always enjoyed sculpting. Um, but I've always done it at home as a hobby on the kitchen table until 2018 when I entered a competition, uh, an international competition uh, in Cyprus. Um, and, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be, uh, be awarded a prize in that. And if funding goes ahead, it's not yet built. The, the lower left-hand image is, the, um, is a, a photograph of, of what I sculpted. It was a concept of something called the noble peasant uh, representing uh, Northern Cyprus and the, um, well, the Turkish Republic and, and the uh, Republic of Cyprus. Uh, now, if it goes ahead and, and the funding is, um, is is realized then it'll become a 42 meter high sculpture on the top of a mountain you know and that's from an amateur on uh, a, a kitchen tabletop up against you know, many more uh, experienced sculptors so that that's the other thing about opportunity and about striving for something that i'd you know we really try to you know pass on to our students etc the piece in the middle is the latest piece uh, that I'm quite happy of finishing. So that's that's really a hobby. That's the creative side outside of the university uh, administrative and, and teaching side. Uh, also, if anybody uh, from the UK recognizes uh, the chap um, with his hand in the air, it's Keith Floyd. He was, uh, you know, there are lots of television celebrity chefs at the moment that you'll see in many countries. But really, Keith Floyd was the person who started this and was the first person to take cooking um, out of the kitchen. And uh, we were good friends. And uh, I was the last person to interview him before he unfortunately uh, passed away and uh, I've always had an interest in food and again it's it's not really about the food it's it's about the situation it's about the conviviality it's about the theater around around food as well which you know comes into a lot of what I think about the creative industries as well uh, on another level there's the uh, a company I recently started with um, a few like-minded people in different parts of the world called the Shadow Guy, and that's using um, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality technologies. Really, we we focused on art galleries and um, castles and stately homes, various buildings of importance for tourism. That, especially during the COVID um, era people weren't able to visit. So really to put those online. And then another aspect, which brings us right up to date and really what the video is, is all about is the culmination of really where I wanted to be in the, in the future, which was um, 
creating a school, not just of design, but design creativity related areas, uh, a, a private school, for not for profit school outside of the outside of the system. And that's what I'd really like to talk to you about next. Why is it a picture of a church? Because that's the the establishment. It's um, it's a church and that's going to be part of it. Why is there a woodland at the bottom? There's an associated woodland. There's a large woodland, you know, 30 acres or so. That's going to be associated with the with the ethos of um, what we're going to be doing within the school. And that's what I'd like to uh, talk you through next. Thank you. Lefteris, if we could play the video, that would be good. Okay, so we've skipped through the first part of it. The first part of it showed you a book. The, the reason for that was because one of the first projects that I did was create a book on, there we are, scholarships, um, how to win university scholarships. That was the first sort of, what could you say, altruistic thing that, um, that I did. So I had the books, had me, what next? What next would come from that? It wasn't enough. I really wanted to, even though I was now working for a nonprofit, out of the mainstream educational system and the creative industries, what did I want to do? I wanted to create a school. I didn't want to complain. I didn't want to whinge. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. I just wanted to get on and, and do it. Um, so what would this school be? It wouldn't be a building. Those were my initial thoughts. I would not have a building. So if, if not a building, where could people go? It would be online. It would be online. The reason for going online is because, uh, you know, during the COVID period, uh, especially there were um, many universities within a very short amount of time had to go online and it worked a lot better than we thought. And, you know, going back to the, um, there's an avalanche coming that I, I referenced earlier on. That was that was one of the predictions. Now more and more online education. So no building, online, bright idea, get going. Done a bit of research, had a roadmap. What's coming next? So what's coming next is yes, you've got an idea. Let's try and rationalize that a little bit. What are the challenges? And to me, the challenges are all are all about, about everything, really, about any project. It's all about expertise. So it's all about people. It's about tools. And it's about finances. Do you have all the expertise available on your own? Typically not. You need plenty of people around you, like-minded people, and those with the talents that are relevant to the project. You need the right tools. And so that, that's what I spent the time gathering and planning. And, um, you know, coming up with a strategy to, to achieve this, this entity. Remember, no building but I wanted it to be completely online for the moment. So plenty of sleepless nights and looking at competitors, looking at uh, various things. But I had a really odd decision. Okay, didn't want, didn't want a building, but that doesn't mean I didn't want an environment. I, I developed a really deep interest in forest schools those that are in Scandinavia. So we bought a forest, we bought a woodland. The woodland is very close to the beach. It's in Scotland, it's in deepest Aberdeenshire. It's very close to a beach and the beach is a wild beach. 
It's a sanctuary for seals. It's a sanctuary for seabirds. It's a, a beautiful environment. It's a beautiful outdoor environment. But really, would it suit would it suit a school? Would I be able to, you know, to, to build a building if I did need anything at all on the in the woodland? Okay, so exciting times, made some progress. We were looking at it, but stop. Yeah, and the reason I'm, one of the reasons I'm putting this in, if it wasn't this circumstance, it would have been another circumstance where sometimes everything just, something happens. You know, in, in this instance, my partner, whoops, Left Terrace, the video has disappeared for me. Is it from here? Tony? Hello? Can you hear okay. me? Okay. I think we can carry on from here. I think I know where we are. Yeah. So um, what happened was something traumatic, very, very, um, very traumatic happened that brought the whole project to the stop, to a stop. Everything was out of balance. Everything needed to stop. But the key to that was uh, getting back into the mix and um, speaking to people, uh, getting the team on board, getting everything back into balance. Once that happened, and it was uh, you know quite a difficult situation to overcome, and we we all have them to a greater or lesser degree, able to to make some progress and um, get everything more or less back on track, refocused. The targets were still the same targets that we wanted to achieve, which was setting up this learning environment. And um, you know, things were things were looking more positive. So yeah, things things were getting back on track, and by things I mean the the arrangements, the timeline, the uh, the people, the infrastructure, the budgets, etc. But then a big decision decided that no, a school in the woods isn't really the way to go. That's um, you know that that's uh, something that I could foresee, but um, I don't think it would gain many many students. So bought a premises to go with the woods, very very close to the woods. It's a church. It's a, it's a large church. So the church and the woodland and the sea combined with a virtual learning environment. which I'm in the process of putting together, combined with residential. Now, residential would be at local hotels or it would be at the two major universities in Aberdeen, Robert Gordon University and the University of Aberdeen. They have, um, they have accommodation there that they, they need to fill. So at various points in the year, uh, students would be invited over, a bit of educational tourism you could say uh, so really that was the that that's the project and that's where we're at at the moment it's being it's being realized what I wanted to do in this part was really have a look at have a look back at the the, the criteria that were really necessary for for realizing this project and it's also criteria that I think are really necessary for us to instill in 
our colleagues and any students that we're teaching. Inspiration is key, curiosity is key, and necessity is uh, a strange one to bring in, but again, um, they do say in 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 English, there's a there's a there's a saying in English: necessity is the mother of creation. If you really need to do something and you've got no op and you've got no alternative, or there's an alt or, or the alternative that you're looking at, you don't really want to do, then um, necessity is a really good driver. Opportunity opportunities come and go. Uh, fortunately. You know, the more you look for opportunity, uh, the more likely you are to, to find them. And opportunities come from a, many places, from talking to people, from research, from looking at what's going on, looking at um, uh, competitors, etc. What was needed? Experience, talent, time, finances. Did I have everything? No, but you need to know how to get it. The experience is out there, I got it. Needed to research, research into the market, observe those that are already um, done something very similar, sought expert advice, and that in itself, you know, once you go through those um, tasks, it, it really does improve your confidence in, in uh, carrying on and you know working further on 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 your project there's a couple more key things coming up resilience is really key we had a bit of a glitch with that um trauma that happened early on in the project that was a trauma that could have killed everything <coughs> um, it certainly had an effect, but you know, to carry on with something um, when when you have a huge setback, um, you know, you could call it resilience. There's, a, you know, it's been a, a bit of a, a common term over the uh, over the past few years, but um, I think it's still still very relevant. And attitude, I, th I think attitude is everything. Uh, again, I can relate it back to the attitude, the positive ad attitude that I had realizing this project and currently realizing it. But, uh, you know, referring back to teaching and students, what really made a good student compared to a poor student was their attitude. It um, wasn't their background. It wasn't their upbringing, if you like. It was, it was their attitude to, to learning. Uh, gratitude's um, a big one, I think, because part of this project, and especially if you're involved in, in leadership in in any industry, but in my case, in, in higher education, genuine gratitude is really, really important. I think it's, um, it's a good leadership attribute. You know, you need to be grateful to the staff that uh, are delivering. And um, yeah, I, this is really culminating the, uh, the the talk in terms of I think looking back in in that um, in that way it, it's it's uh, it's two pieces of string tied together in a knot and uh, it's called a it's well known um, hopefully you've seen it before it's called a why not and really that's that's the attitude that I've had in mind across. I guess everything I've done, including this project, which is, um, you know, pourquoi pas, why not? I don't mean it as a glib thing when you're offered an opportunity, you say, why not? On the surface to be, uh, what could you say, enthusiastic about it? You could say, yes, why not? 
But underneath, in the background, you want to be checking out every single reason why not to do this. And then when you've done that, if you're happy that it's going to be a success, you can go back and say again, yeah, why not? Thank you very much. Well, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. And uh, it was really, really enjoyable. Would like the audience to participate with questions. You can type questions at the comments box. Uh, so tell us. Uh, so, so what is the next step out of all this, Tony? Oh gosh, the next step is um, painting the fences at the church, getting it ready getting the virtual learning environment online. But yeah, Lefteris, thank you for asking me because the, the next step, I tried to focus all the way along. Yeah, on, It's all about connections and things take time and it's all about people. Okay, Absolutely. One, it's gonna be a virtual learning environment. And what I want to do is to develop <clears throat> a community of um, teaching professionals that would like to work with me. Mm -hmm. you know from this environment they can one scenario they can deliver their courses online from wherever they live and come over for a brilliant time a fun time in scotland for two weeks to have a residential with their classes that they've been, te been teaching all year online you can have a residential spend time in the forest team building you know confidence building etc spend time on the beach Gonzalo is asking us if we have an opening date. We have an opening date. I'm looking at Easter 2023. Easter, 2023. Yeah. 2023. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. There's been an awful lot of work in the background. And um, yeah, it's coming on. What do I lack? People. I need people. people. <laughs> like minded Fantastic. people. Thank That's you. why we're creating events like that. And uh, yes, you know, so we can be all connected. It's absolutely, Penny. It's absolutely be all connected. Uh, thanks. Lester. We're actually we're actually running quite early. <laughs> uh, Are we? I thought yes. I spoke overtime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my Paris, what I what I can uh, do, talk a bit more about the school a little bit. Yeah. What what I what I want to do? What I what I saw hurting things. Gonzalo yeah. wants to propose workshops as well, he says. Yeah, so God, yeah, yeah, workshops. Absolutely. And, I've, got a, uh, I've got several people involved as well already, uh, but... And however, also Prof Professor Shima Banker says, thank you, this sounds so interesting. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Sounds yeah, amazing. But, I need to skip the forest from Lisa. Uh, Lisa, the beach is beautiful as well. So the forest is amazing, but the beach is beautiful. We need to clear out the foxes from the bit from the forest. There's too oh. many foxes in there at the moment. Oh, so we need to do something. However, however, Les Terrace, the I don't know if your your audience has heard of um, Gordonston School. It's a it's a private school mm -hmm. uh, in Prince Philip, who you know the Queen's husband, uh, um, King Charles, who we now have. They went there when they were younger. Now it's very close to where I'm setting up this this school, and it has you could call it a a modern, but I, I think it's uh, an ancient philosophy, a Greek philosophy on education. It's of the mind and of the body. So what they what they do at Gordonston and what I'd like to really replicate is focus on the the outward bound things as well you know the physical side you know, yes. being, being in a forest being on the beach cutting down trees doing um group work in nature looking after the environment etc cetera, etc cetera, together with the more traditional and academic studies so that that's why i'm really happy to being able to come combine the two things together okay I, it's going to be, it's always difficult to combine that outdoors nature alongside a traditional academic course at the same yeah. time. 
So what I what I'd like to do is split them, do the the academic stuff online, traditionally, with you know great teachers, and then that residential would all be about these building self esteem, building teamwork, building confidence. In the woods. <laughs> Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Anything else that, that the network here can provide? Um, Any other support? Yeah, just support. If they can yeah. contact me and just give me, yeah. just encourage me to go on, it will make a difference. It's only, it's never going to be for thousands of students. Yeah. There's never going to be a huge administration. That's exactly what I don't want. Yeah, I, don't of course. Want, I don't I don't want the administrative to to uh, to overtake the educators. No, it, it's it's going to be different. And like I mentioned at the beginning, it's um you know, it doesn't happen all at once. It happens little by little. Absolutely. And, every, and everything's connected. So perhaps with luck, the little change that we're able to to make happen in Scotland on this project can maybe have bigger implications elsewhere. Who Absolutely. Knows? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is the purpose of uh, uh, yeah. Virtual Design Education Forum and uh, the New Art School and the podcast and all that yeah. all that work we're doing yeah. to, to help with the things like that as well. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of benefit in just getting, out, getting it out there that people are doing something. People aren't looking at retirement. And mm. basically that's one option I could have taken, but I didn't want to. I'd get there. <laughs> I, I don't see laying on the beach for years as freedom. You know, I wanted to do something a bit more, um, uh, a bit more impactful. Let's yeah, say. Penny says, I think Peter Gabriel went uh, to Gordstone. Are you connected with the Black Mountain College? Uh, yeah. No, no, I'm not. Mm. No, I'm mm. not. Well, Black Mountain College, yes, uh, from the US. That's the, yeah, it, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting story. It sounds good. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And sorry, it's wonderful sorry keynote. Bit. It was left terrace. It was me pressing the wrong button. No, don't worry. Don't worry. We got, we're fully, we're fully. So now you can join us back in the audience. So if you go to the normal hopping link, right, you can follow, you can join this form, this forum as, as an audience to follow all the other lectures. Okay. Well, I'll just have a coffee and de-stress and then I'll jump back in. Thank you. Fantastic. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thanks bye -bye. so much. Bye-bye.